If that wasn't a warning for a preacher, I don't know what is. The people of Nazareth don't like Jesus' sermons, so they try to th throw him off a cliff. I suppose I should be relieved that Worthington is so flat. Less danger of that here. As someone who was once a brand new preacher, I have such compassion for Jesus in this story. Maybe you do too, as you look back on your first days in your school or work life, how the first couple of times you tried something new, it didn't go the way that you expected. Jesus really is new to this preaching thing. It is right at the beginning of his public ministry. Jesus received the Holy Spirit at his baptism, then immediately went into the wilderness for a kind of desert retreat. While there, he was tempted by Satan, who offered him power and glory if Jesus turned from God and gave his loyalty to Satan. But Jesus, with the Holy Spirit giving him strength, said no. Jesus knows that he belongs to God, and God has given him good news to proclaim. Jesus returns from the wilderness on fire with the Holy Spirit. There's something powerful that people recognize in him. Even before he's done much, news about him is beginning to spread. He travels around Galilee, his home region, and teaches in synagogues. Finally, he comes to Nazareth the village where he grew up. I get the sense that Jesus is reluctant to go back to Nazareth. Today, Nazareth is the largest city in northern Israel with about 78,000 residents. But in Jesus' time, Nazareth was a speck on the map with only a few hundred people. Villages that size have their gifts. They're often places where families have deep roots and a real sense of belonging. But for Jesus, God in human flesh, with a mission to redeem the whole world, Nazareth must have seemed like a very small box. Never mind that he's 30 now, a grown adult with his own life. In Nazareth, he would always be little Jesus, the carpenter's boy, who was never very good at soccer and always wanted two slices of cake. So, of course, Jesus heads off somewhere else to teach for the first time. And as word spreads about Jesus, someone in Nazareth, maybe a synagogue leader, maybe a proud uncle, thinks he should be invited back. The hometown boy has made good. His own people should get to hear him in action. It starts off well. On the Sabbath day, Jesus goes back to the synagogue where he learned to read the scriptures. He stands up to read, and someone hands him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He reads, The Spirit of God is upon me, because God has chosen me to bring good news to the poor. God has sent me to proclaim freedom to prisoners, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor when all debts will be forgiven. And then Jesus sits down to teach. He says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The people of Nazareth are thrilled. They think Jesus is talking about them. The hometown boy has come home to bring good news to them. He will set their prisoners free, heal their blind ones, relieve their oppression, forgive their debts. This is fantastic. All Nazareth will rejoice. But then Jesus gives a self-fulfilling prophecy. No prophet is accepted in their hometown. And he makes sure it comes true. He reminds them of the terrible drought that hit Israel during the prophet Elijah's time how it didn't rain for three and a half years and the crops kept failing. Lots of widows in Israel suffered, but Elijah didn't help them. He went to a foreigner at Zarephath and provided her with food for her family. And there were lots of Israelites ill with leprosy in the prophet Elisha's time, but Elisha didn't help them. He healed another foreigner, Naaman the Syrian. The people of Nazareth begin to understand what Jesus is telling them. He will not heal them or set them free. 
No blessings for you, Nazareth. Those in the synagogue are enraged. How dare he help other people but not them? They've known this boy all his life. How dare he come back here and swagger like he's God's own messenger and not help them? The people of Nazareth are so furious, they chase Jesus out of the synagogue, up the street, to the top of the hill where they can throw him off a cliff. It is a narrow escape for Jesus. Perhaps later in life, an older, more experienced Jesus would look back on that sermon in Nazareth and wince. He may not have intended to be that harsh, but you can understand how his words stung. And Jesus himself learned an important lesson in his hometown synagogue, one that would follow him for the rest of his life. Sometimes the good news will be rejected. Jesus will proclaim the message that the kingdom of God is near, that God loves absolutely everyone with no exceptions, that we are to love God and love our neighbors as ourselves, and people won't want to hear it. The people of Nazareth will try to fling Jesus off a cliff. Other people elsewhere will walk away from his preaching. Still others will crucify him for it. The good news of love is so challenging, so offensive, that some people would rather kill than hear it. I think one reason the good news is rejected is that love is hard. This is perhaps best articulated by the Apostle Paul. The 13th chapter of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians is often read at weddings, but Paul is not talking about romantic love. The Greek word he uses, agape, means love of neighbor. We often think of love as warm feelings, but for Paul and for Jesus, love is active. It requires us to do things. Love means showing up in the hospital room in the jail cell, praying for someone when we don't really want to, speaking and acting in defense of the vulnerable, setting aside our wants so that others can have what they truly need. Love is available to everyone. You don't need any special gifts to be able to love. But love makes all other gifts effective. Whatever we do, however generous we are, only when we act out of love will we accomplish anything at all. To love like this is really challenging. We should not be surprised, Jesus was not surprised, that some people don't want to hear this good news. I don't know about you, but to me, the most despair-inducing thing about the pandemic is that so many people are so lacking in love that they do not care in the least whether their neighbors live or die. I'm going to pick on British Prime Minister Boris Johnson for this because, frankly, he has earned it. As has been widely reported, the Johnson government imposed strict lockdown rules in England while Johnson, his staff, and his family were throwing parties at Downing Street. Ordinary Britons were forbidden from saying farewell to dying loved ones while the Prime Minister was boozing it up with his staff. The country is justifiably outraged that a different set of rules seems to apply to their leader. What has been less commented on is that the Prime Minister and his staff worked together for years in some cases. These people like each other enough to socialize together. Do they not care at all about each other's health? About the other people they are in close contact with? Their own elderly parents? Downing Street's drivers and security personnel and their elderly parents? The answer appears to be no, they don't care. Their lack of love for the people close to them is enough to make you ask why we bother. Why bother with the hard work of love when so many people don't care? We bother because God is love and we belong to God. 
and love is the work Jesus has given us to do. And we gain strength and inspiration from others who are doing the hard work of love. Last week, New Zealand's Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, announced new restrictions after the first outbreak of Omicron in her country. She was supposed to get married this month, but she also announced that her own wedding would not go forward as planned. Ardern said, I just joined many other New Zealanders who've had an experience like that as a result of the pandemic. And to anyone caught up in that scenario, I am so sorry. But we are all so resilient, and I know we understand we are doing this for one another, and it will help us carry on. That's love. That's love. And she's right. It does help us to carry on. There will always be those who want to hurl us off a cliff for proclaiming the good news of love. But we do it anyway, as Jesus did, because love is the work he has given us to do. And this hurting world desperately needs more love, love that bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So whatever rejection we may face, we go out into the world to do the hard work of love in Jesus' name. <laughs>